thank you very much, James, and good morning from California. I'm so excited to be here today speaking about a topic that is very, very topical. Here in California, our state has been ravaged by fires. It is uh, the morning time, but it is dark, uh, amber-colored skies uh, due to the fires. It was 100 degrees Fahrenheit in San Francisco over the weekend, so clearly something is not right. And as we talk about climate change, as we talk about the need to spur zero emission vehicles, uh, EVs, the importance it has to our climate, to our environment, it just could not be more topical. And thank you also to Green TV for its leadership and dedication to our climate goals during these extremely challenging times. Now I'm just gonna speak for five minutes or so, uh, a couple items to talk about as we lead up to our panel. I'll focus on the scale of the issues we face in driving uh, pun intended e-mobility investments. And then I'll very briefly speak to the path forward and further frame concerns for our panel as we orient the discussion, as James noted, around investment-driven solutions. Now, today's panel focuses on what I believe is one of the smartest long-term investments that we can make, which is e-mobility. And if I turn to the scale of the issues we confront, I'll talk about California, and I'll first start with our transportation sector. Uh, in California, the transportation sector accounts for more than 40% of statewide emissions. So in order to decarbonize transportation, we must deploy zero emission vehicles throughout our state. Uh, everyone on this line knows, I know James and our panelists understand very well that if we take our state, zero emission vehicles are critical to public health, to air quality, and to meeting our emission reduction goals. However, in order to reach our goals, 40% below 1990 levels by 2030, we need to increase our annual reduction rate from 1.1% to 4.5%. If we don't, we will not reach our climate goals until 2061. In California, we've got 720,000 plus EVs on the road and more than 27,000 public charging stations today. But this is a far cry from the 5 million goal for zero emission vehicles by 2030. And in order to get there, we must increase our numbers an average of 23% annually starting now. On the EV infrastructure side, which is where I have the most familiarity, California will need to install charging points at about 20 times, 20 times the current rate, completing 18 sites per day for the next five years in order to meet our 2025 goal of 250,000. This is critical because we know that the lack of charging infrastructure is considered a significant barrier to the wide acceptance of electric vehicles. So where's the money for EV infrastructure coming from? If we look at California, currently our state has enough funding for 160,000 charging stations, but needs funding for 90,000 more to reach the 250,000 goal. The California Public Utilities Commission has already approved 700 million for utilities to invest in EV infrastructure through 2024. And 436 million has come from Southern California Edison's EV infrastructure program, of which 50% is located in underserved communities. There are also numerous state programs providing financial support for charging infrastructure, including the Energy Commission's $384 million program. And recently, the leadership group, uh, one of our member companies, ChargePoint, announced that it closed 127 million in incremental equity financing. It's all very exciting, but it's just not enough. We must develop financing solutions and structures to support large-scale EV charging infrastructure. And I would close with a couple points on the path forward as we open this up to our panel. At the leadership group, as James noted, 
Uh, we have membership of roughly 350 of the largest employers here in Silicon Valley. Our EV member companies include Proterra, Tesla, General Motors, BYD, ChargePoint, uh, Analex, and Bolt to Charging. Uh, we are trying to lead the electrification of public, private, and commercial vehicles. And it's also about competitiveness. And as we look to recover from COVID-19, as we talk about enviral, environmental equity and racial justice, environmental equity in our underserved communities, we support pursuing a recovery that meets a triple bottom line, which is creating genuine, equal economic stim stimulus, meeting community resiliency needs, and finally targeting clean investments to support underserved communities hardest hit by climate change and by COVID-19. This is the environmental equity that I spoke to earlier. So I'll just finish by saying that the clock is ticking and we must move faster. In spite of our technological leadership, we have a long way to go on financing and implementation to meet our 2030 goals, but we've got an esteemed panel here today that I know has a lot of great thinking and solutionating going on to share with all of you. So I'll leave it there to open it up to our panelists and James and uh, to everyone here. Thank you very much again for having me and so many of our Silicon Valley Leadership Group member companies today. Thank you very much, Ahmad. It's, it's really great to see you here today. And I know you've just joined um, SVL, uh, Silicon Valley Leadership Group. And, you know, that really sets the direction for the rest of this panel. And we really appreciate this overview. So right now I have a, a question for you uh, as part of our panel here today. Uh, I know you have a lot of experience in the public-private partnerships investments. Um, what are the key factors that you see as the most important to success for these partnerships when sustainability, uh, sustainably building out EV infrastructure? Yeah, it's a great question, James. And I think it follows on the introduction I gave that really speaks to the, the challenges we face in meeting the gap for financing EV infrastructure on a large scale. And there are probably two or three issues that I believe are pretty paramount in addressing to be able to solve this problem. And I worked on this as an investment banker at Barclays. We had some pretty innovative programs with some of our member companies to try and spur EV charging station investment in particular. And we were not really able to, to see the deals close and get to a point where we needed to be. So I wish I had great solutions for you, but, but I do not. I do know what some of the impediments are. Uh, one is that the useful life of the asset has got to usually match the term of financing. Others on the panel will be able to speak to this in more detail than I, but technology is evolving every day. If you're looking at a five or seven year financing for matching the useful life of an asset, it's very difficult to fund at a scale that you need in a manner that is affordable to your borrower. Uh, there's a lot of free money out there. So in my case, we were dealing with public sector entities trying to get large scale EV charging infrastructure funded for say a city or a county. Why should they finance that when they can get the money for free from some of the programs or the state that I mentioned earlier? But the problem with that is going pay as you go on an incremental basis does not get us where we need to be now or in the very near future. And I think maybe the last point here is when you look at the revenue stream and how you actually pay back the debt with which uh, you would finance this infrastructure. If you took it on the general fund of say a municipality, if it was for their own EV fleet, that might make sense. Or if you were able to backstop that debt with grant money, that might make sense if you had a high degree of probability the grant could be funded. But it's just not possible to charge enough for charging from consumers to be able to pay the debt service associated with financing that type of infrastructure. So I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the easy answers here, but I hope that at least begins to set the table for the rest of our esteemed panel. No worries, thanks Ahmad. Um, you know, I think, just to let everyone know, please submit your questions for Ahmad through the Q&A panel. Uh, if you had, go to the bottom of your, your screen there, you'll see the Q&A uh, box please hit that, send Ahmad or any of the other panelists a question and we'll make sure to, to try and get them and, and ask them. But we do, Ahmad, we do have a, uh, a question for you right now. 
Um, this is from A. a. Thomas. Uh, does the global infrastructure community understand the huge significance needed for decarbonization of the entire transportation sector? And will it therefore pull the financial levers at scale needed to deliver the total transformation? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would speak to that looking at maybe one segment of the institutional investor community, right? And I would speak specifically to uh, ESG investors, environmental social governance investors. When we talk about climate change, when we talk about social impact, this is a, a burgeoning sector that we've seen with large institutions that is growing at a rapid scale. I saw a number last week that had a, a $20 trillion number for the potential ESG market today. And what I found uh, working on social impact financings was that there was more capital in need of placement than projects to be financed. So speaking to this question very specifically, looking at infrastructure and EV charging infrastructure, I have no doubt that within the large institutions, within impact funds, within ESG funds, there is enough capital there. I think the question is finding a financing structure a scale that works for these larger investors. A $5 million deal doesn't cut it. You need scale at 350 million, you know, uh, larger numbers to be able to entice the, uh, the Eaton Vans, the Fidelity, the Vanguards, the Goldman Sachs, the JP Morgans, et cetera. But I know that within their goals, when we talk about climate change, when we talk about impact infrastructure, EV charging infrastructure certainly meets that investing criteria. Yeah, very cool. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, how have you seen the e-mobility investment trends change in the last five years? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say, at least from what we see, looking at some of our member companies, I would take ChargePoint as one example, where mm -hmm. we've seen a tremendous amount of success. Proterra is another example where Ryan Popple uh, recently has left to a, a chairman executive director role there who sits on the board to which I report but they have been very, very competitive and I think very successful in being able to raise more funds. We mentioned the uh, series that just closed for ChargePoint. So I answer that very simply by saying that I believe that there is more capital and more willingness, more demand to invest in some of our innovative companies. Now, where I don't know the answer, or I might be interested in what other panelists might have to say, is what that means for the, the burgeoning or more startup companies within this space. We know for uh, GM projects, we know for ChargePoint, we know for Proterra, the money is there uh, because they have an established product and they've been able to show leadership within the sector. I don't know the answer when we speak to the growth beyond the well-established firms within this space. But I do know if we look back over the last five years and how the companies who have done well and who have been able to separate themselves have fared, uh, the, the outlook previously and going forward has been very, very strong. And, you know, you look at the leadership of if we t pick up Proterra as, as one choice, I've gotten to know Ryan a little bit serving on the board, I, I would be extremely bullish because I think that there's a recognition as I rattled off some of the numbers looking at California, the steps we need to take to meet our emission reduction goals, I think there's a very clear recognition that the private sector is going to drive these solutions. And maybe that recognition is more clear today than it was five to 10 years ago. Yeah, no, very cool. Thank you, Ahmad. Uh, another question here from uh, Ash Vinsuri. Uh, in your view, what level of IRR returns can investments in EV charging infrastructure deliver to investors? Yeah, that's a good question because if we look at it, I'll speak to specifically what I know, which are the deals that we try to uh, structure related to municipalities. So these are public sector uh, transactions that we, we did not bring a deal to market or close, but that we look to to try and finance for, say, a, a fleet, a fleet of EVs. And if you're looking at IRR, you're just looking at return period, it's very low, right? Uh, a municipality that's in California at double or, or triple A for some of these, if you take San Mateo County, for example, where I live, which is where many of the VCs are based, 
they have a triple A credit rating. So they are going out and borrowing if you're taking a, say an equipment lease program, if I were to pick one. Um, the rates are gonna be in the, I don't know, maybe 3% uh, yield, right? If you're looking at your all in TIC, your total interest cost, it might be slightly less than that. So you've got to have a cause here that goes beyond return. Uh, I, I, I don't, for the deals that I have, have spoken about here on this panel, I don't see a very strong or compelling case to be made for a, say a, a, a PE type return, right? There has to be an impact calculus that's factored in here because the public sector deals or a deal that might be grant, uh, have, have grant backing or grants in some way providing a, a double barrel backstop to the borrowing, that's further driving down the borrowing costs. So these are not in any way high yield transactions, even on an unrated basis, uh, in my opinion. No, thank you, Ahmad. That's uh, really important. And, and thank you for going through those, uh, through those details. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have some panelist to panelist questions. So what will happen is uh, I'll be, um, I'll be introducing uh, the, the panelists and the, the person that they're asking to, and they're going to ask uh, that question a, a, as we move forward. Michael, you're, you're right here now. I know you've got a question for Ahmad around state-run infrastructure and green banks. Please shoot away for Ahmad. Sure, yeah, I was um, appreciated your, your comments earlier, Ahmad, and was thinking about uh, the California Infrastructure Bank, your Green Bank, and lots of other um, organizations, initiatives coming up like this. What role do you think they have to play and uh, you know, how can banks and other private entities best partner with them? Yeah, that's a great question, Michael. And uh, you know, I loved what Catherine said about the private, public, private construct for being able to fund EV infrastructure, charging infrastructure on a large scale. Because I would submit that if you take, for example, our state infrastructure bank uh, in and of itself, or even the state grant funding that might help uh, backstop borrowing by a municipality to fund EV charging infrastructure. That is not sufficient, uh, in my view, to be able to do so on any type of large scale. You have municipal equipment leasing programs that for a smaller deal, 15, $20 million, you probably find a way to make that pencil. But I really think that concept, and, and I don't know what that broader answer is. I thought Catherine was really eloquent in, in laying out the framework for a solution. But I think if you can somehow tie the economic output from a, a, a commercial corridor or a, a charging corridor where you have that third leg of the stool being user fees, right? I don't know what it, it might be from that third private component and contributing to funding the infrastructure. I think that's how you get there. But you certainly have the vehicle in using the state infrastructure bank and being able to use, you know, we, we call that, um, you know, it's, it's almost like a joint venture where you have the municipality issuing through that debt vehicle. And it does sometimes, I think, you know, it, it sometimes is a better option than the municipality issuing on its own. Thanks very much, Ahmad. Uh, next question we have here is, uh, Roby has a question for Ahmad again, uh, on, on with regards to retail fuel locations and, and converting to electric points. Uh, Roby, shoot away. Yeah, sure. Thanks, James. Uh, Ahmad, you know, as you were talking, it, it got me thinking when we talk about the complexity of and, and, the, and the, the number of charge points you'd need. Um, you know, in my, earlier in my career, I worked for, I ran a family office here in town that was built upon the backs of the uh, of, 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 uh, diesel and gas distribution. So the traditional fossil fuel industry, and you have truck stops and, and, and uh, gas stations throughout the country that would seem like the most logical spot to like, you know, convert those points to um, to, to electrification. I mean, the question I have is, um, you've seen some of these, and Arcady mentioned some of the early investors, you know, that have gotten into the space. Um, why aren't we seeing more of that, particularly on the retail side, or, you know, where the large retail networks aren't investing in some of that charging infrastructure? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think there's a real opportunity there, and I'm not sure exactly what the, you know, what the challenges have been to date when you look at that. Uh, what comes to my mind is the lack of scale, right? If I'm thinking about how you might structure a financing around this and you don't 
you know, you're looking at one-off projects, you don't have to scale across an entire network of stops. Uh, it doesn't really, in, in my view, begin to pencil. Um, now, where that might be different is the notion I had mentioned um, in, in my remarks around the ESG investors. When you're looking at impact investors that might have a mission that is beyond only the return uh, that might be driving their decision. But I, I would imagine I might submit that it's probably an issue of, of scale. I'm curious if others in the audience or others on the panel might have more thought uh, around that. But scale seems to be an issue when we look at, you know, if you're just talking about trying to get a, a municipality to do a, a fleet financing, right, for an EV fleet that might be their vehicles and include police vehicles as well. You often don't have enough scale to be able to drive the financing that you would need to beat a pay-as-you-go option. Thank you, uh, Ahmad. That's that's uh, really helpful. Uh, before we finish up our uh, our time today, uh, I'd just like uh, every um, panelist here just to give their perhaps their one sentence thought on, on what the direction is for uh, electric vehicles and our future investment and a key message that you would like to leave our audience as we take away, uh, move this away. So uh, Ahmed, uh, can you give us your closing sentence for us? Uh, sure, and I, I would take it from Catherine's remarks, which I, I was really struck by what she said, the private, public, private, and the need for that third leg of the financing stool to see large scale.